Welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. And uh, I just wanted to say that I am very excited to be able to teach this lesson today because I just find this section of Scripture so fascinating. We're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 12, which is the last seal, which introduces the first of the four trumpets. So we're going to try to get through the first four trumpets today. Um, before I do, let me just say that, you know, I have a hypothesis, which you are going to hear me explain in the study today over the first four trumpets, which it may be possible that you have never heard before. And so just realize that this is a hypothesis. I'm not saying this is 100% factual. And so please don't burn me at the stake for this. Uh, just I'm just trying to get you to see Revelation uh, from a new perspective, from a fresh perspective, um, uh, I know some of the other interpretations for this passage, uh, which may be true, uh, more literal, a lot of, uh, especially from the uh, pre-tribulation camp, a lot of the more literal interpretations of this passage. Uh, today, I want to give you a, a more broad, symbolic interpretation of this passage. So let's get started today with our passage or actually do some review. Uh, so far, we have opened up the sixth, uh, the sixth, uh, six of the seven seals uh, that began our journey through the what we call the Great Tribulation. So we've seen the first six seals in the scripture here. So remember, the only difference between the Great Tribulation and the tribulation is basically the intensity of the tribulation. So, in reality, the the phrase "great tribulation," even though Jesus used the word "great tribulation," um, is kind of an artificial theological term. Uh, we have a lot of opinions out there, a lot of theological opinions over the difference between the two, between what is tribulation. And what is great tribulation? And so some theologians call the first half of the revelation the tribulation, and they call the second half of these visions of the revelation the great tribulation. And so I, you are going to hear me refer to the entire passage as the great tribulation. So the whole event is the great tribulation. I don't really divide the Great Tribulation in half like some do and say this part is tribulation, this part is Great Tribulation. I just described the whole event as the Great Tribulation. So, and how am I defining the Great Tribulation? So my definition of the Great Tribulation is a time of global suffering like the world has never known before or will know again. So that's my definition of the Great Tribulation. And that, I feel like that's an easy definition. I feel like sometimes we make these things too complicated. And so last week uh, we saw um, we saw the seven uh, six of the seven seals. And what did those represent? Do you remember? So uh, remember the pattern as well. We have four global events and three woes. And somewhere in between the woes was an interlude. And that's going to be the same for all the three sets of seven. So Sil 1 represented the spirit of the Antichrist that, that is coming into the world, that brings false peace and worldwide conflict. Now, I want you to remember this important passage. We talked about it before. It's First it's John chapter 1, verses uh First uh, John chapter 2, verses 18, and he says, Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. For we know, for this we know that the last hour has come. So John is telling us in this passage that the, the last days, the last hour, the eschaton, is already here. It's already started. The spirit, the Antichrist is coming that, you know, that you've heard about, that you all are very familiar with, this Antichrist. He's coming. But there's already Antichrist here. 
And so what John is trying to say is that the end times has already started. It's already now. And so um, in a way, you can start to see some of these events as already kind of happening. Like the spirit of the Antichrist, which is Satan, is already in the world. He's in the world now, and there's a sense that he is going to be continuing to become more powerful and eventually rise up this Antichrist figure. Okay, you guys follow me? So with the first seal that we opened, we saw the, the arrival of this Antichrist figure. He brings false peace, and that false peace eventually leads to worldwide conflict. Now, that world, when we saw the second seal open, that world conflict led into global war, into world war. And that led into the third seal, which led to a global food crisis. World war is going to lead into a global food crisis, if you can imagine it. And what is that going to lead to? Pestilence. The global famine leads to the deaths, uh, deaths of one-fourth of the world's population. So, in Seal 6, world, uh, the, the global, uh, oh, I, I missed Seal 5, was the first woe, and, and, and we see this intensity increasing with the fifth seal, the first woe, this global crisis kind of seems to lead to the persecution of the believers. And then six, the sixth seal, the persecution of the saints, leads to the day of the Lord, judgment day. Remember, the saints are crying out, when, how long until you bring judgment upon the world for what they have done for us? And in sixth seal, we see that now is the time to bring the judgment on the world. So we've seen these first six seals, and if you need to go back and review, go ahead and review those. And we also got our first interlude. So remember, we get the, the four global events, the three woes, and the one interlude. And with our interlude, we saw the 144,000 and the great multitude in the throne room. This was a multitude too great to count. Now, I don't want to go back into all that conversation. You can review that video if you'd like. Um, but these two groups, the 144,000, I missed a zero there, and the great multitude, they're interrelated somehow. And if you want to know how, go back and watch that video. But the elder around the throne of Father God told John that this multitude, uh, this great multitude was those who had died in the great tribulation so this great multitude died in the great tribulation that brings us up to speed with our review i know uh, that was a lot of stuff we've covered over the last couple weeks uh, so today i'd like to start with an introduction so today we're going to open up the seventh seal which is going to introduce the first uh, the seven trumpets and we're going to try to cover the first four of the seven trumpets so why were trumpets used and what was their purpose well among many things trumpets were used to warn people of things or to give an alert it's kind of like uh, when you're watching your TV program and all of a sudden a tornado warning pops up in the corner of your TV screen advising you that hey there's a tornado you need to sh seek shelter until uh, the time stated in 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 the area stated that is what the trumpets do they're they're warning us of something something is coming something is going to happen warning so uh, there's another there's another observation I'd like to make let me uh, get us up to speed here. So, 
while the first four seals seem to be the result of uh, satanically influenced man-made events. Remember we talked about that? These seem to be man satanically influenced man-made events. Uh, global skirmishes, world war, famine, pestilence. Things that mankind has brought on themselves. The first four trumpets seem to be natural, satanically influenced global disasters. So natural disasters. So we see a pattern here. It's the same pattern. It's just in, uh, being described in a new way. So many see these uh, events as a um, as a reflection, or um, many see the the ten plagues of Egypt as a reflection of what we're going to be studying here. Now, there may be some similarities between the ten plagues of Egypt and what we see here. Um, and if you would like to go through that, you can find the plagues of Egypt found in Exodus chapters 3 through 14. We are not going to do that today. There are some similarities, and I, I feel like... Um, that the the exodus was a prophetic event that that it was going to kind of uh foreshadow something that was going to happen in the future in the end time but you can compare that on your own but i would like to make a few simple observations from the exodus the first is that jesus is the real passover lamb of god who comes to take away the sins of the world he is the Passover lamb. He is the lion who is the lamb. Remember, we saw that. The next thing I want us to realize about the plagues from Egypt is that God protected Israel from the plagues that were brought upon Egypt. Now, that doesn't say that Egypt didn't suffer some kind of, uh, Israel didn't suffer some kind of tribulation in Egypt. They did. They suffered tribulation for 400 years. <laughs> people died. People were tortured in slavery. They had a hard, difficult life before God brought the plagues on Egypt. But there was tribulation for 400 years. And then they had to pass through the wilderness for 40 more years after the plagues before they were able to to enter into the promised land. So just some uh, thoughts on, on the Exodus before uh, to get you thinking, maybe if it is a foreshadowing, what it's trying to foreshadow in our present time. So let's go ahead and get started today. That, that's the, all the in, uh, introduction I have. We're going to get started in chapter 8 today in verse 1. So let's look at that passage. When the lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about half an hour. So what happens here? The seal is opened and there is silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Now, no one really knows for sure why there is silence in heaven for about half an hour. I think, personally, that this could just be the awe of the moment. Just imagine everything that you have seen taking place in, this, in, in these visions, and then all of a sudden, there's just, and then the seven seals finally open, and there's just this anticipation, this waiting, this awe moment. All kinds of theologians have all kinds of different interpretations for this. And really the answer is, we don't know the answer. <laughs> we don't know why there's a half an hour of silence. But it is an awe moment. Um, why do you think there's silence in heaven for a half an hour? Let's go on then to uh, verse 2. Verse 2 says, I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. <clears throat> so, 
So seven angels were given seven trumpets. So here we come into another confusing part of Revelation. It appears as if the day of the Lord occurred back in the, the sixth seal. So, again, the question is, are these visions in chronological order, or are they overlapping somehow? So, but notice now that it doesn't appear to be uh, the day of the Lord anymore. The day of the Lord seemed to be happening back at the sixth seal. What seems to be happening now is we get seven new trumpets. So either they're, they're overlapping or we are going to, again, go back and look over the Great Tribulation as uh, from a new or different perspective. Uh, in my opinion, this is not chronological order. I believe that um, the new vision here um, is going to be somehow overlapping with the seals. But that's only my opinion. And I, I could be wrong. A lot of other people have a lot of different other opinions over how, how these visions uh, coordinate with one another. So a lot of, uh, like, especially from the pre-trib uh, groups have a lot of chronology that they like to attend to. But I personally lean towards the trumpets overlapping the seals because of the sixth seal really appears to be the day of the Lord. What do you think? Let's look at verses eight, uh, chapter eight, verses uh, three and four. Then another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar, and a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascending up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. So John is... is is having a vision here in, in, in heaven again. Um, what happened? We see another angel. Another means a different angel. And he mixed the incense in the temple with the prayers of God's people. So one of the things that we have to remember about... Uh, one of my phrases I like to say is that things in the physical realm represent and cooperate with things in the spiritual realm. Remember, I asked you to remember that phrase because we're going to be hearing it over and over again. And the earthly temple of God represents and cooperates with the earth, heavenly temple of God. So the temple that we saw in the Old Testament of Moses was a symbol uh, or a shadow of the real in the heavenly realm. So things in the physical realm represent and cooperate with things in the spiritual realm. The earthly temple, the temple of, of, of the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament was only a foreshadowing. It, it represented and it cooperated with the heavenly temple. So here we see the angel in heaven taking a coal from the altar and taking it to the most holy holy place and mixing it with the prayers of the saints so in the old testament we find that the the priest uh would take the coals twice a day once in the evening and once in the once in the um uh morning and they would take it into the holy place and they would burn the incense and the incense would the smoke would rise into the air, and the incense represented uh, the prayers of God's people rising up to God. Look at uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. We see an example of this. One day, 
Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priest, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord to burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. Zechariah is the father of John the Baptist. Uh, burning incense was was a, uh, could have been a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, they cast all the priests would cast lots, and if if you finally came up, then you you got the you got the opportunity, possibly the once in a lifetime opportunity, to finally go in and burn the incense before God, which represents the prayer of God's people. And notice that in this passage, it says that there was a great crowd outside praying, which represents what's happening. On the inside of these prayers rising up but another reason why the people were outside praying was for Zechariah because if for some reason he had some kind of sin left on his in his life he could die um, offering in uh, offering this incense before God and they would tie a rope around the around the priest and they would drag him out if they died inside which you know must have happened occasionally because they had to have a rope to get him out so they they had a contingency plan, um, but we see that that the prayers rising up to God as an incense. So, I want to go back to that prayer, though. I want you to think about your prayers as being a pleasing incense being offered up to God. Have you ever thought about your prayer as an offering to God? Uh, the verse says that the prayers mixed with the incense were an offering on the altar. So your prayers are an offering to Father God, and the angels they call they call um, they call God's people holy. What does that mean? What does it mean to be holy? It's a good question. All right, let's go on to verse five. Back in Revelation 8. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth. And thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. Here we see apocalyptic language again. Apocalyptic means end of the world. Fire represents judgment. The angel takes the fire and hurls it down upon the earth. And thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. Um, this is the third woeful event of the seven seals. So this kind of brings the seven seals to its rightful conclusion and introduces the... the um, seven trumpets so if you have any questions over that let me know but just realize that this language here thunder crashed lightning flashed and there's a ter terrible earthquake that's going to be repeated over and over again in revelation we're going to see that uh, a few more times so this isn't going to be the last time you see it so it's a Phrase that is repeated. Um, remember, within the seven trumps, uh, trumpets, we're going to see the same pattern. We're going to see four global events, three woeful events, and an interlude. So it's going to follow the same pattern. All right, so let's go to the first trumpet. Verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> Then the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty blasts. The first angel blew his trumpet, and hell and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. One third of the earth was set on fire, one third of the trees were burned, and all the green grass was burned. So what happens here? The angel prepares to blow their trumpets and the first trumpet is blown we have hell fire and blood now is this literal does the angel 
literally hurl down blood? Does he literally hurl down fire or hell? Possibly. I'm not saying the angel doesn't do that, but these three things are all symbolic of judgment. The angel is hurling down judgment. That's what you should see. Um, I don't know if these things are literal or symbolic, but I will be giving you um, the symbolic um, uh, meanings in this in this study. And I'm not saying that God can't hurl down hell, fire, and blood. He easily could. He's God. Um, and these things are possible. But we are studying apocalyptic literature, which by nature, apocalyptic literature is symbolic. So they might be literal or they not, might be symbolic, but we are studying a symbolic type of literature. What is important is the response. That's what I want you guys to see. The response of the judgment. The response and effect of the vision on the earth is what is important. This is the first global event. The first global natural disaster. Um, a third of the world, the third of the earth, becomes uninhabitable. And the whole earth becomes unfertile. The green grass is all burned up. We get this picture of scorched earth. A place that is not very um, nice for us to live in. Not a very good environment to live in. Um, now, could this be the effects of global warming? I very well think it is possible. I'm not saying 100% that this is global warming. But we, we are heading in a direction where it seems like the world is becoming warmer and that's exactly the picture we see that the earth becomes heated to a point that it becomes a third of it becomes uninhabitable and the green grass kind of just withers away. Um, regardless, survival is going to become difficult during this time period. Growing food. Think about how hard it's going to be to grow food in this kind of environment. People are going to suffer. This is going to be a great tribulation. Let's look at verse 8 and 9. <clears throat> then the second angel blew his trumpet, and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One third of the water in the sea became blood. One third of all the living things in the sea died, and one third of all the ships on the sea were destroyed. Again, I don't know if the mountain is literal or symbolic. It could be a meteorite. It could be something literal. Or it could be symbolic. It, it does have a symbolic meaning. It is symbolic of judgment. Remember, fire represents judgment. A huge mountain of fire is a huge obstacle of judgment being hurled down, being plagued upon the sea. So a great obstacle plagues the sea. I'm sticking to the symbolic meaning here. What happened? A third of the world's oceans become so polluted and so uninhabitable that no survival in those areas are even possible. So, we've seen the plague upon the earth, uh, upon the land. We've seen the plague upon the ocean. Now, look, let's look at verses 10, 10 through 11. Then the third angel blew his trumpet. And a great star fell from the sky, burning like a torch. It fell on one-third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star was Bitterness. It made one-third of the water bitter, and many people died from drinking the bitter 
water. <clears throat> so, a star. A star in the Bible can represent an, an, a messenger, an angelic being, possibly a demonic being, some kind of influence. It could be literal, astrological, uh, or it could be something else, something symbolic. We don't really know the answer to that for sure. No one knows any of these answers for sure, whether they're literal or symbolic. That is a question for when the time comes, we will know the answer. But again, what is the result? Um, it became bitter. The fresh water, the drinking supply, it has a name. The angel has a name. The star has a name. Bitterness or bitter. One third of the world's water supply becomes too poisonous to drink. And when people do drink it, they're going to die from it because it is undrinkable. So there's the first three trumpets. And then finally, the last trumpet. Verse 12, then the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and one-third of the sun was struck, and one-third of the moon, and one-third of the stars, and they became dark, and one-third of the day was dark, and also one-third of the night. So, with the fourth trumpet, again, John is having a vision, the light was struck. Were the sun and moon literally struck, or could this be something else? Basically, the result is a third of the light in the world is blocked out. I believe this is massive air pollution. The world is darkened. Could this be a possibility? So let's, let's look at the conclusion here. This brings us to the end of the four trumpets. The first trumpet, uh, we saw that a third of the world becomes too hot to live, and the whole earth becomes dry. And in the second trumpet, a third of the ocean becomes too polluted to navigate or produce life. And in the third trumpet, a third of the world's fresh water supply becomes too poisonous to drink. In the fourth trumpet, the air becomes so polluted or blocked, that it, a third of the light is blocked out. I want us to step into a time machine and go back into to John's day. Um, these events in John's day must have seemed to be an impossibility. How could these travesties happen on the whole earth? But then... Come back to today. It's not hard to imagine a time or a day where we have global war, we have global famine, a food storage shortage, and we have global pollution. Land, air, sea, fresh drinking water, all of it polluted. It's not hard to imagine this kind of pollution in the world. It's almost like we have been prepa being preparing ourselves for this great tribulation from the beginning. And, and, and there's an interesting concept that I've been thinking about, and that is, you know, within the schemes. So within the uh, preterist scheme, which is the gone by scheme, that's the scheme that believes that all this was fulfilled in the day of John when he was writing this. So it represents, you know, some some of the events around the Roman Empire and such as that. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't really see these things happening in the first century. I'm not an expert on the first century. Uh, that would be a good question for Craig Keener. How were these events fulfilled in the first century? Uh, I just don't see these events being fulfilled in the first century. And as far as the um, 
historicist scheme, I don't see a time in history where any of these events have ever been fulfilled. Where a third of the world's water supply was too poisonous to drink, a third of the air was blocked out, uh, the light was blocked out, um, the air, the, the ground became uninhabitable. Uh, I just don't see a time when, when this has happened throughout history. But I want you to think about the, the other two schemes that we have left, which is the futurist scheme, which believes that this, this happens, this is an event um, that happens in the future. Um, and also the, the spiritualist scheme that says these, these represent uh, principles um, throughout the world. But we can see how almost the historicist, where these events take place over time, um, view. So the historicists, they interpret Revelation as these events are taking place over the entire time from the, the day of John until they are finally fulfilled. And the futurist scheme, which sees these all happening in a future time, well, you can see how the historicist scheme and the futurist scheme kind of rub shoulders here because we can see an increase in ocean pollution. We can see over time an increase in freshwater pollution. We can see an increase of air pollution. We can see um, all of these things that John is talking about as increasing over time, but we can also jump forward and say this is futurist and we can see how there will be a time when this will be fulfilled in the future. So a lot of people get stuck in their schemes, preterist, spiritualist, historicist, futurist. Um, maybe it's, you know, not one. Maybe it's all of the above. Remember, the preterist, that could be a foreshadowing of the futurist. Um, and some of these things are seem to be progressing. John says the end is already here. The eschaton is already here. It's not a future event. John says it's here now. He said that in 1 John. But we can also see how some of these events are taking place in the future. So with, I feel like with the first four trumpets especially, we can see how it's already but not yet. We see that already but not yet in Scripture. We already see the oceans being polluted. We already see the air being polluted. We already see the fresh water being polluted in the land being polluted but we haven't gotten to a point yet where we see these events being fulfilled as they have been fulfilled in revelation just an interesting passage of scripture now what am i not saying i'm not saying that this is 100 percent factual what i'm saying might it's just a hypothesis again um i could be very wrong this could be all futurists this could be very literal um Blood, hell, fire could literally be hurled down out of heaven. I'm not saying that's not a possibility. I'm just trying to open us up to see um, Revelation in a fresh lens and some other possibilities. Because the answer is we don't know for sure um, whether these events are 100% literal or 100% uh, symbolic or a mixture of literal and symbolic. or We don't know. These visions are chronological, or if they're overlapping, or a mixture between chronology and overlapping. We need to be looking at this from different angles. That's what I'm trying to do here. So I hope that, you know, with the first uh, four seals and the first four trumpets, we see, uh, you see that, um, that symbology becoming a, uh, more clear. What What is happening? It's like people look at Revelation and they get so bogged down and like I don't understand well I hope you understand better today it's it's not hard to see what John's trying to say the world's becoming uh, uninhabitable the drinking water is becoming poisonous the air is blocking out the light and the oceans are becoming uninhabitable that's not hard to see what John's trying to say in this passage all right so lots of interpretations um, resulting in very similar conclusions I uh, hope you enjoyed the Bible study. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to make a comment in the comment section, and I'll try to get back to you. 
See you next time. God bless.